Hi everyone and welcome to the final mini lecture, Assessments, Standards, and Accountability. Do I hear cheering in the background? Yes, this is the final mini lecture. In this presentation, we'll cover different types of assessments, standards and how they tie in with assessments, and how both are used for accountability. So, what do we mean by assessment? According to our textbook authors, Kaplan and Owings, assessment is the professional judgment used to determine the meaning given to measurement, evaluation, and grading. In other words, we need to know more than a test score or grade to truly understand how much students are learning or how well a school is educating our children. We need to be able to put the data into a context to give it meaning. Kaplan and Owings add that educational assessment is a process of determining what the test scores and grades mean in terms of the quality of students learning and performance. Part of the assessment process is using standards to identify what students should know and be able to do. Finally, they write, accountability is a system of being responsible for student achievement. Schools and districts are accountable to the public to provide quality education, right? An accountability system is a means of doing this, of providing measures of student achievement. So let's unpack this a bit. When I hear the word assessment used in an education context, I usually think first test of some kind. Every one of us has been assessed or tested in different ways just to get where we are now. We all took many tests over the course of our educational years. But how were those tests and assessments used by the education system? I said previously that assessments are a way to measure achievement and provide evidence of accountability. But what does this mean for students? Many of these assessments are high stakes tests, such as the SOLs or the SAT test. High stakes means they are used to make important decisions about our education. Some are used to place students into a program or at a certain level. Those same tests might be used for gatekeeping, such as college entrance. Still others are diagnostic, which means they are usually administered by someone with special training and they identify obstacles to student learning. An example might be an English test for English learners or a math diagnostic test for placement into a math track. You may also hear the term formative assessments, which are designed for learning and to provide feedback about students' mastery or weaknesses related to a standard. An example of a formative assessment in our course is the discussion board assignments and other weekly work you've been doing. You hopefully learn from doing this work and it provides me with an indication of your understanding of the content. Finally, you may hear the word summative assessments. These are used to appraise learning and make judgments about whether students have met a standard. I've said a couple of times now that standards identify what students should know and be able to do. After all, what are we measuring when we assess? We need to have some end goal in mind. Standards often contain benchmarks that identify expectations by grade level. Other standards are contained in rubrics, such as the rubric used in our course. Rubrics detail what is expected and provide a way to measure or assess student work. Most of us have probably heard of the Common Core State Standards, or here in Virginia we have our Standards of Learning. There are also standards used in teacher preparation programs. They're called the Interstate New Teacher Assessment and Support Consortia. They're used to judge whether teachers have met the standards necessary to enter the profession. Finally, we come to the term accountability. I said accountability is to be responsible for something. Schools are responsible to the public for educating its children, right? 
but how do we as a society hold students, uh, schools accountable? How do we judge or know whether school districts are doing their job? We know that one important way the public holds schools accountable is by student performance, most often through high stakes testing or summative test scores. In Virginia, we have the SOLs, for example. But accountability needs to be more than test scores. Our textbook authors suggest that accountability is systematic. Educational accountability includes not only educators, but also parents, students, and the community. What does this all mean? Well, we know that schools are financed by public dollars so parents, as taxpayers, are answerable or accountable to pay their taxes. As well, students are accountable to show up and participate in their education. And finally, schools are part of the community. They're public property built on public land. They need to be kept up and maintained. In this way, educational accountability is a broader and systematic process of making groups of people answerable to one another. So what about equity and fairness? Where does that fit into this system? Well, we know that the achievement gap is a real problem with implications for large groups of students. Some of these implications involve placement Students with lower scores are placed in low-track classes. Gatekeeping tests often prevent students from being admitted to colleges and universities or other programs. And what is fair in terms of accountability? The achievement gap often situates the problem within the student as the one who is deficient. We know that achievement is correlated and influenced by SES race, and gender. But we also hold teachers accountable for student achievement. We've learned that effective teaching is one of the biggest influences on student achievement. But how can we hold teachers solely accountable if other groups are not doing their part? What if the school is crumbling or there are no books for students to read? And what about parents and guardians and where do they fit in? They have a responsibility too, right? They have to be responsible citizens and pay their taxes, but they also need to get their children to school. Wherein lies the fairness and equity in such a complex accountability system? Do we build new schools with swimming pools? Do we pay teachers better salaries? Do we, have, do, we do a better job preparing teachers in the first place? What are the answers? Well, you know, I like to end things in a special way, and I've come to the end of this mini lecture and the end of the course. I hope I'm leaving you with many questions that you will continue to think about, and I hope you gained new knowledge about the education system in our country. I hope you've learned that there is no one way or right way or correct answer about how to change or improve education. There's just philosophies, purposes, the burden of a troubled history, complex structure and finance, and now you. So please go forth and engage in the discourse of education as a critical thinker.